Hey friends, how are you doing? I hope you're doing well. Um, my name is Josh Palmer and I'm the pastor at Melchon Baptist Church. It's great that you joined me today. I hope and I pray uh, that God will bless uh, our time together and also that we will learn something from his word uh, today. So before we do anything, let's just bow our heads and pray together. O oh Lord our God, you are worthy of all our praise. You are the God who never fails to keep his promises. We thank you that in Jesus' life, death and resurrection, we see your love, justice, mercy, provision and victory. You are the God who lifts up those who are weighed down. You are the God who provides for your children. Our desire is to praise you as long as we live. So, Father, give us listening ears and open hearts to hear what you want us to hear. In your precious name we ask. Amen. Hey, friends at Stonehouse Baptist Church. Uh, what a privilege to join you guys. I'm just uh, buzzing. But um, before we uh, go into God's word, let me just briefly give you um, an introduction about myself and my family. So um, I'm married to a beautiful woman called Lana. And uh, we've got two wonderful children, uh, Jeremiah, who's uh, four years old, and Esther, who's just turned two. We've been at uh, Melchon Baptist Church for over a year now. And before uh, pastoring here, I was in uh, Cardiff for eight and a half years, uh, where we did youth work, children's work. And in the latter time, I was uh, involved with being their assistant pastor. Uh, Simon, it's great that you asked me to join, um, but thanks so much, May. Uh, I hope and I pray that together we'll be able to do more things like this. Um, and may God's name be glorified through everything that we do. So um, let's dive into God's word. Let's, if you don't have your Bibles, hit pause, go and grab your Bibles. And let's read this passage that we have uh, before us. Friends, today's reading is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 9, uh, verses 1 to 7. It's titled, Jesus Heals a Man Born Blind. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in, I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After th saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Uh, may God bless our time as we spend time in his word. Friends, I don't know about you, but lately I've had some time to reflect on a lot of things including the things that I take for granted in life. One of those things is sight. For those of us who have been blessed with the ability to see, uh, we don't know what, is, what it is like not to see. Max Lucado writes about one particular man who was blind. He says, for 51 years, Bob Edens was blind. He couldn't see a thing. His world was a black hole of sounds and smells. He felt his way through five decades of darkness. And then he could see. A skilled surgeon performed a complicated operation for the first time. Bob Edens had sight. He found it overwhelming. I never would have dreamed that yellow is so yellow, he exclaimed. I don't have the words. I'm amazed by yellow, but red is my favourite colour. I just can't believe red. I can see the shape 
of the moon. And I love, I'd like nothing better than seeing a jet plane flying across the sky, leaving a vapor trail. And of course, sun, sunrises and sunsets. And at night, I look at the stars in the sky and the flashing light. You could never know how wonderful everything is. How many of you have played an obstacle course game blindfolded? I want to also ask how many of you have ever um, had a place, had to place a blindfold on and have a friend to lead you somewhere? Not one of the best position to be in. And that is exactly what it's like for thousands of people who are blind. Just imagine for a moment, my friend, what it would be like never to see a sunset. Imagine for a moment what it would be like to never see the faces of those whom you love. Imagine for a moment never to see the birds who sing or the colours of the flowers. In these verses that I read earlier to you, it says, He saw him. Jesus saw the blind man, took notice of his case, and looked upon him with concern. Now before the text, uh, some background information is necessary. In John chapter 8, Jesus has had a busy day. He had just forgiven the woman caught in adultery. He has claimed to be the light of the world. And he has angered the Jews to the point that they were going to stone him. But they couldn't. He was always able to flee because it was not his time to be delivered. Though Jesus was in his flight from a threatening danger and escaping with his life, yet he willingly halted and stayed a while to, to show mercy to this poor man. Jesus saw him. Blind or handicapped individuals had their place to maintain for begging. This poor man could not see Jesus, but Jesus could see him. In verse 2, the disciples ask the question to Jesus. Why was the man blind? It was universal opinion among the Jews that calamities of all kinds were the effects of sin. The case, however, of this man was that of one that he was blind from his birth. And it was a question which the disciples could not determine whether it was his fault or that of his parents. This passage um, really resonates with me hugely. My dad is an evangelist in North India who works among blind people. He goes around various blind hostels and schools sharing the good news of Jesus, giving them braille bibles and literature, but he also provides them with help when needed. I've seen him doing this since my teenage years. And I've visited with him various blind schools and hostels, doing various programs for them, whether it be Christmas or Easter, My friends, this is the same viewpoint of many still in India. My dad in his conversations often hears blind people saying that this is due to my sins from my previous life that I am blind. Karma. That's what they believe in. So they are okay with how they are treated and they accept it. So Talking about God's love for them, it's quite an alien concept for them. Coming back to this text, the disciples take it for granted that this extraordinary calamity was the punishment of some uncommon wickedness and that this man was a sinner above all that dwelt in Jerusalem. Okay, so God had a plan for this man's blindness. And his plan was that this man would be born blind 
and that he would remain blind up till this moment in time when he would encounter Jesus and Jesus would heal him. And by healing him, Jesus would show that he was God the Son and that he was God in flesh, Emmanuel. But God's plan also includes a secondary purpose. You see in verse 4, before Jesus heals the man, he's going to take a bit of time um, to teach his disciples. Firstly, he tells them that sin didn't cause the man's blindness, but rather it was part of God's plan. He says that when he says, the works of God could be displayed in him. But then he goes on to say to them, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming, then no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, do you notice how he includes his disciples and, and, and us into this doing of the works? Jesus intends his followers to be doing what he has been doing. In fact, that's kind of what following someone actually means. We walk where they walk. We go where they go. We engage ourselves in the things they are doing. So when you come across someone in need, how do you respond? You can respond like the Pharisees usually did. In other words, you can look at the person with contempt or indifference. You can respond like the disciples do here in John 9. You could say, oh, look how spiritual we are. Obviously, that man sinned, but we didn't. We didn't. So we can talk in a theological manner about him and his condition. Or, my friends, we can be followers of Jesus and respond as he would. How does he respond? He responds with grace and mercy and action. In other words, he doesn't just say, oh, poor you, I feel really bad for you, but, but he does something. Now, that doesn't mean that we can necessarily heal like Jesus does. The spiritual gift of healing, we're told, is given as the Spirit wills. You can't just manufacture it and make it happen on your own. God has to be involved in those kinds of miracles. But we can pray for healing. And we can help the individual who needs help. We can do something to show God's love and God's glory. And again, that's why he said, we must work the works of him who sent me. The point is, my friends, work while you can. Serve God while you can. Live for him every day. Or as John Piper says, don't waste your life. Okay, let's get on with the text. So Jesus has noticed this man. The man doesn't see him or calls out to him. Jesus initiates this contact. And Jesus also takes the opportunity to teach a lesson to his disciples as well. Look at verses 6 and 7. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seen. Now, this is one of those things where you go, Okay, that's strange. Jesus spits on the ground, makes mud out of it, puts the mud on the man's eyes and tells him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. That's weird, right? But at the same time, we know that Jesus never did anything without a reason. Now, I've looked into quite a few commentaries to try and see what wiser men than me said about the reason Jesus did this. John MacArthur said, I don't know why Jesus did this. Matthew Henry basically tied it back to the fact that God created man out of, of the dust of the earth. Another commentator took uh, that even further and said that Jesus made brand new eyeballs for the guy. 
the ancient Jewish commentators believed that saliva had some uh, medicinal properties. Now, I don't, I don't know uh, we have any evidence for any of this. But I think the answer is here, right in front of us. In John 9, in verse 4, Jesus says, We have to work while it's day. Now, just jump down a few verses to verse 14. It says, It was a Sabbath day when Jesus made mud. And then in verse 16, the Pharisees use that as an excuse. They say, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Jesus, therefore, by making um, the spittle, showed them their manner of keeping the day was superstitious and that he dared to do a thing which they esteemed unlawful. He showed that their interpretation of the law of the Sabbath was contrary to the intention of God and that his disciples were not bound by their notions of the sacredness of that day. Another reason may have been that it was common for prophets uh, to use some symbolical or expressive action in, in working miracles. So in this case, Jesus, by this act, showed to the blind man that the power of healing came from him, who anointed his eyes. Jesus had power to give sight to the blind. So according to them, how did Jesus break the Sabbath? He worked. How did he work? He made mud. It's ridiculous, right? Um, you made a mud pie, you worked, you broke the Sabbath. It never ceases to amaze me how um, insane and irrational people can be. But that's how they work. And I really think that that's why Jesus did it this way. He had already gotten to them about and annoyed them for healing on the Sabbath and telling the man to take up his bed and walk. Now Jesus is making mud in this passage. He's doing the work. How dare he? Why? Because he just said it. Darkness is coming. He knows his time is short. He knows that soon he's going to be nailed to the cross and shed his blood for our sin. All of this stuff has to be in accordance with God's plan and purposes. The blind man is blind so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus does the work of God on the Sabbath so that the works of God, meaning salvation for sinners, can be fulfilled. Isn't God amazing? Jesus put, uh, you know, puts some mud on the man's eyes and tells him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Friends, let me ask you this question. What does faith do? What does true saving faith do? How does it show itself? What did Abel do when he believed God? He offered a, a more acceptable sacrifice. What did Noah do when he believed God? He built an ark. What did Abraham do when he believed God? He went to a foreign land. He offered up Isaac. What did Moses do when he believed God? He refused to be called Pharaoh's son, choosing instead to suffer reproach by faith he left Egypt, and by faith he kept the Passover. So how do we know this man believed? He obeyed. He trusted Jesus. He went to the pool of Siloam, and he did as he was commanded to do. And look what happened. It says right there, and he came back seeing. Now I'm not saying that we do works for salvation. The Bible doesn't teach us that. It teaches that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. What I'm saying is that what Bible is saying is that a person who is saved and that a person who has true saving faith will follow, obey and give evidence 
to their salvation and their faith by serving the Lord. That's the thing. True saving faith is an obeying faith. It's a giving faith. It's a following faith. The man is commanded by Jesus to go wash in the pool of Siloam. That's what he does. It's a simple act of obedience that came out of faith. And you know what happened. Going back to India and my dad. My dad, uh, before he uh, did blind ministry, he worked for Operation Mobilization, OEM, for, for years and years with my mum. That's where they met. And they, they were based in India. While working for them, you know, he had, uh, he had a good job there. And uh, he was providing for our family. But God then one day spoke to him clearly. And gave him this vision to work among blind people, sharing the good news. And he quit his job and he started to work among blind people, living by faith. And guess what? Not up, up till today we can say, we've not had one day as a family where we've been hungry. God's always met our needs. He's always provided what we've needed. He obeyed. That obedience came out of faith. Coming back to us, to our passage, the blind man came back seeing. He listened to Jesus and did what was asked. He didn't grumble about the mud on his face, but he simply listened and obeyed. So my friends, my question is, are you being obedient to what God is asking you to do? Are you ready to get up and do what he's asking you to do? I hope and I pray that this has encouraged you and challenged you. And my, my prayer for us is that we will be willing to get up and do when we've been told by him who knows the best for our lives. My friends, may God bless you and keep you safe. Let's just bow our heads and pray together. Father God, we thank you for our time together. Thank you for your word that teaches us, instructs us, guides us, challenges us. I hope and I pray that we'll be people who would be ready to hear your voice and do what you ask us to do. I pray for our world. I pray for people who are uh, suffering due to this pandemic. Either through ill health or they've just lost their loved ones. We pray for your comfort and your love to be amongst them. For those who, who are feeling broken, I pray that you please restore them. For those who are feeling weak, I pray that you bring strength. For those who are weeping, I pray that may Lord, may you bring joy in their life. For those who have doubts, pray that you bring faith. Lord, we pray for all those who are feeling anxious in this time. Lord, may your peace be among them. God, you are with us. Help us to bring our struggles to you. You're a God of peace. Please bring comfort in our chaos. Lord, I pray that um, we will dwell on your word uh, day by day. And Lord, continue to speak to us and guide us. Lord, we look out and we see the weather changing. But it's so reassuring to know 
that the weather's changed, the season changed, but you never. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much for dying on that cross for us, for our sins, so that we can be forgiven. And you didn't stay dead. You rose again, defeating death. And you're alive today. Lord, thank you so much. We praise you. We give you all the adoration. So lead us and guide us in our life. Help us to seek your will and not our own. Be with us all. In your precious name. Amen. My friends, if there's anything that you need prayer for, then please email me at Melsham. Baptistchurch at gmail.com and uh, please be assured of my prayers for you and uh, I look forward to a one day where we can uh, worship together in person but please stay safe and remember that God is with you. May God bless you and keep you safe. Let's say uh, the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. May God bless you and keep you safe. Take care guys. God bless.